Go ahead and administer the community development planning. The first item we have today is a public <coughs> presentation and it's informational only and it's regarding the summit of the Reservation. Madam Chair, and members of the committee, um, this is is on your agenda this evening as an informational item only, uh, because this has come will be coming to you on your June twentieth City Council agenda as an action item coming forward from the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission uh, considered revisions to the sign code at their May 29th meeting, so I'd be happy to kind of walk you through that process and uh, what you will have before you for action. Uh, on June 20th. So as most of you are aware, back in 2015 we started a lengthy evaluation and inventory process of our sign code. Um, really prompted uh, primarily by a resident who attended a committee meeting um, and was concerned uh, primarily about temporary signs. Um, but the council at that time wanted staff to conduct an inventory to understand what we had in the city before we started uh, considering revisions to the sign code and or uh, moving forward with more proactive enforcement. So, uh, went through a series of public meetings, uh, discussions surrounding the sign code changes, and eventually in the spring of 2017, we made some revisions to the existing uh, sign codes. One of the things that the council had directed staff to do was following uh, the adoption of those changes, and again, before we started out and doing any enforcement, they wanted us to do some education. So the letters were sent um, talking about the new regulations and trying to educate, and then we really started uh, enforcement efforts in earnest. And as is not uncommon when we start the enforcement efforts, um, we start to hear uh, issues that are brought to our attention uh, and feedback on the provisions of the sign code and the application of the sign code. And we did that both at the council level and staff level. Um, we did continue to hear feedback regarding some of the prohibited sign types, uh, particularly as they uh, related to pole signs. Um, the council committees have discussed this issue on several occasions in 2017 and 2018 and ultimately provided direction to staff to look at some proposed revisions which might allow for a reuse of currently prohibited uh, sign types, but to do so on a limited or case-by-case -case basis. So as we researched and looked at options to accomplish that, uh, the thing that seemed to make the most sense was creating a new sign category uh, entitled Signs of Historic Significance. And the intent of creating new language and a new definition or a new sign code type was to provide a mechanism which would allow for the preservation, maintenance, or reuse of signage that contributes to a mission's unique character, history, or identity, but would otherwise be prohibited. So revisions to the code were drafted published in the legal record and then presented to the Planning Commission at their May 29th meeting. Um, probably the best thing at, at this point, I might in your packet if you have that, is direct you to the actual ordinance. It's the cleanest copy and I think is easiest to work from in order to show you the where we started and the recommendation of the Planning Commission that will be before you. So one of the things that we took an opportunity to do uh, as we were looking at adding this new section of the code was also to clean up section 420.220 which relates to non-conforming signs and if you waded through the red line version of that you really saw that we just rearranged a lot of sentences and there was nothing substantial that changed there. The new section, section 430, uh, 130, uh, establishes the signs of historic significance, talks about their purpose, the criteria for identification, the process for uh, and the process for making application for those. Um, when the sign code revisions were published in the legal record, if you look at that section 430.130 and you go to B, the original revisions included the seven criteria which are included in numbers one and two in one um, one list. One list. They were not separated. And the language indicated that in order to uh, qualify for identification as a sign of historic significance, you would have to meet three out of those seven criteria. Um, the feedback that I heard really almost immediately from the publication and distribution of that was that if we were really looking at focusing on that historic significance, that um, 
only having to achieve three out of those seven criteria really left the lane open a little bit wider than probably was intended um, for uh, signs and applications to be made through that process because you could actually have a structurally safe sound, st structurally safe sign um, of any type and um, and if you were re retaining the majority of its character you'd kind of met those standards um, and, you, and really there were opportunities for that historic uh, contribution to not even factor into that. So as it moved through the Planning Commission uh, some of those same issues were raised, and so the Planning Commission had conversations about whether or not it made sense to make some of these criteria prerequisite. Um, and ultimately, that is the recommendation that was approved 7 to 1 by the Planning Commission uh, at their May 29th meeting. And so, in order to submit an application and be considered for uh, identification as a historic sign, um, the sign would have to comply with those four criteria outlined in B1. Uh, being installed at least 40 years prior to the date of application is safe or can be made safe without substantially altering its appearance, retains the majority of its character defining features, materials, technology, structures, color, shapes, symbols, text, or art, and then exemplifies cultural, economic, and historic heritage of the city. Then in addition, if the sign uh, meets those four criteria, uh, there are the, the criteria outlined in BE2 may also be considered in the application process. So the process is set out that application would be made um, either by the property owner having control of the sign or the city can make application to the Planning Commission. Uh, if the Planning Commission's decision is uh, adverse or not favorable, uh, the applicant would have the opportunity to appeal that decision to the City Council uh, within 30 days. So it creates a review uh, and appeal process that does not currently exist for science within our codes as well. So I will stop there. Again, the recommendation of the council, or the planning commission, uh, includes uh, the items as they're laid out in the draft ordinance. Uh, and that would be an action item for you at your June 20th meeting. So we're happy to answer any questions. Yes. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for making the changes uh, to be, because I think it makes it clear that it's focused on historic are in one through one uh, A through D in, in item B one, um, and then item B two uh, separates that out. The one there are a couple of things that are just minor that I would suggest, and, and maybe it's not worth doing. But I would reverse the order of B and D because it seems to me the priority is really on the cultural heritage, not on the fact that the, the sign is stru structurally safe. So I just would reverse the, the order of those two in B1. It's minor. But the other element is I think in 2B, that really is not a process, but it's, it's a definition, is it not? Because it says the sign may include but not limited to a detached sign, a pole sign, and so it's more definitional than it is part of the process. So I'm not quite sure why 2B even needs to be there. Well, I think that the um, the rationale behind 2B is, is contained in the last section, uh, I think this is critical, that was permitted on the property at the time the sign was installed. So you, you could, and I don't know of an example, but you could have an example that was a, of a sign that was installed illegally from its inception. Okay. And that um, 2B would then kick you out of consideration uh, okay. potentially for that. Okay. Okay. I'm fine with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. On the, uh, under B there, says that the uh, proposed sign of historic significance shall comply with at least three of the following criteria, which means there's four of these that would not have to comply with. And number four says the sign is structurally safe. No, you're looking at the Oh, yeah. Look at the newer there. Uh, it's on page 15. Yeah, if you can pull the ordinance up. Page 17 is the clean yeah, copy. Yeah, the clean copy is on 17.
I'm sorry, I know that that's the yeah. challenge with ordinances is that you get the red line in there and, yeah. and then when the planning commission added changes it got even more convoluted. So they, they took out yeah. uh, thank you. Okay. should have thought about this ahead of time, but um, would it be the procedure that any enforcement actions would be like stayed during an application, or would that be like at the discretion of city staff? So if there was a sign that was in violation and this process was ongoing, would that be put on pause? Or well, I think that's certainly our intention now. I think going forward we would have the opportunity to educate if, if this is incorporated into our sign codes. Um, that as those issues might arise or, or uh, become relevant, we could certainly educate in advance of that prior okay. to any enforcement action. Thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. All right, at this time I'd like to invite anybody from the public to go ahead and speak if they would like to in regards to the sign revisions. Recreation Capital Improvement uh, Program to replace the rubberized athletic flooring in the cardio room, weight room, and main stairwell of the community center, as well as the north stairwell. An invitation to bid was published in the legal record and also mailed directly to six flooring contractors. One bid was received, and staff is recommending approval of the proposal from Quality Custom Flooring in amount of $66,379.60 to complete the flooring replacement project. The project budget was $85,000, res resulting in a savings of approximately $18,000. Save money. Good job. And she spends it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. Let me celebrate. <laughs> I'm really excited about getting, sorry, I have yeah. my voice. I'm really excited about getting the stairwell for a place. I, so, I, I watch that. Yeah, I, I go up there a lot and I'm just really excited about that. Yes. So we really good. But even the, the flooring in those two rooms has seen its better day. <laughs> All right, any questions? I was going to ask, is it, is it the same? Materials before I knew it was a difference on the pool, but I no, it's going to be, it's a it's a different material. Okay. Of course, since the building was built 20 years ago, there's been advances <laughs> okay. in in the materials and everything. So it's it's a thicker uh, rubberized. Uh, it's actually going to be black with gray and blue chip colors in it, kind of carrying through with our mission blue theme, and we'll give the and that's in this cardio and weight room area. Haven't picked out the treads for the stairs yet, but that's going to, it'll be something that ties into that, that it'll give the area a whole new look. So, and it's also thicker. I don't know if many of you have spent any time sitting in the administration office, but Kathy's office or Janet and Natalie's, and when the guys are up there and, and they drop a weight, is it, I, I don't have to worry about them taking naps in the middle of the afternoon because <laughs> it is impossible because the weights are dropped and they come flying up out of their chairs. This will eliminate a little bit of that. It's going to provide some more cushion and impact Good. resistance. So yeah, that's that's going to help us savings and employee productivity. And that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Christy, you're up again. Regards to the recommendation. Oh, pardon me. Go. I recommend we go ahead, but I don't know if it's consent. Consent. Yeah. Consent. Okay, that's fine. Sure, the next is the uh, replacing of the pool surface. So also in the 2018 Parks and Recreation, Recreation Capital Improvement Program included funds to replace the surface of the indoor pool at the Sylvester Powell Community Center, which was last replaced in August of 2008. The resurfacing project was bid in the legal record 
It also mailed specifically to five qualified contractors. One bid was received and staff is recommending approval of the proposal for Mid-America Pool renovations in a total amount of $57,100 to resurface the pool with a diamond bright material. The project budget was $50,000 and staff recommends using the savings realized through the cardio, weight room, stairwell, flooring replacement project to address the $7,100 shortfall. The durability of the uh, new product is not as durable as the existing one. Is it is not. There's like five different materials out there that you can surface pools with, mortar being a very common one. But it it's very common but has the least life, life expectancy. Next common is a diamond bright uh, because of price. Then you have a pebble sheen and a pebble tech, and then your river rock, kind of in that order uh, with pricing. So it, the, yeah. does it is it more slippery than it is than not the, slippery. It is smoother. Okay. So we do of, get complaints now we, with with people with the river rock material that we have now saying yeah. that the yeah. pool, the bottom of the pool, is too rough. If you would, Chris, you talk about installation and yeah. scheduling, please. Yeah. Now, absolutely, these things cannot happen without some sort of interruption to <laughs> uh, the daily operation of the facility. The natatorium is definitely going to take the whole month of August to complete. They'll come in, they'll tear off all the old stuff, sandblast that off, haul it out, bring the new stuff in. So that'll, that'll definitely take... Uh, the entire month. So they have, per the agreement that we have, uh, specific dates for starting construction and completing construction. As far as the uh, flooring in the weight room, cardio room, uh, goes, that they also have dates, and that's August 27th through 31st. And at that point, we are going to go ahead and close the entire facility for those days. This is going to be the first time we've ever done that. But what we're going to be able to accomplish in that time is, first of all, we have to take all of the weight equipment out and cardio equipment out, set it around the track. Mm -hmm. So that really kind of completely closes down the, the top floor of the facility. Then also during that time, we will be doing our annual floor resurfacing where we close the north gym for a couple days, the racquetball courts, then the south gym, and then the aerobics room. So we're just going to get all of that done in one week. So we'll be doing, that will be contracted work that we'll be doing. We'll also paint almost every wall in the building, except those on the second floor because it will be hard to access. But the north and south gym, the conference center, breakout room, party room, multi-purpose room, and hallways. We also will be waxing all of our tile floors. We will be grouting the floors in the locker rooms and the showers and the steam room. And if all goes well, we will also stain, stay, sand, stain, and reseal both of the entry desks. So, and that's what kind of the maintenance side will be doing. As far as the professional staff, we will be doing for the first time in at least 11 years a complete clean out of every one of our closets, <laughs> um, all of our offices, uh, the storage unit, uh, those things, and then also give people an opportunity to take some vacation time if they choose to do so. But that's, that's the plan for that week while we're closed. Are there any events that have to be rescheduled? <coughs> I'm sorry? Are there any events? That's what I'm saying. You know, um, there, we have the Stroke Foundation. We've already reached out to them. They're just going to take that week off. We had Relive that was in there on Tuesday. Um, and they just canceled their event. Murano Homes Association and our senior insurance group, but those were, were all making accommodations on that. Also, during the month of August, when the pool is closed, uh, anybody who wants to come to the community center, whether they have a membership or they're wanting to do a daily drop-in to use that, they will be able to go to the aquatic center to use that. We'll have that open now. Of course, that'll be just the competition pool during those hours, which is really what you would have at, at the uh, community center also. So the, those will be open. And you'll open at 6 a.m.? 6 a.m. 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
Are we going to do it? Are we going to do any other sort of like incentive for that that week that we're going to be closed for people that normally are not month to month membership? Yeah. What? And I did reach out to other community centers in the area to see if they do close, to do a complete closure. And uh, Matt Ross has done a complete closure in the past. Old Latham has done a complete closure in the past. Lee Summit has done a complete closure. Um, Olathe is the only one who said what they do is if any of their members come in and say, hey, I'm losing a whole month or a whole week uh, out of my membership here, then we'll credit their membership for a week. But it is, it's not just a blanket, do it to everybody. If somebody approaches us, we'll definitely, definitely take care of them. I'm assuming we're putting this in like the Mission Magazine and next door and all we, that stuff. We will definitely get it all out there, yes. Now that we've made you aware of it, we'll probably go ahead and, and get some signage up around the facility, start making sure that people are aware of it and giving them plenty of time to, to make other plans that they need to. This might already be something in the works, but I think it might be a good idea to have a, like an open house afterwards, especially because we're concerned about um, income from the um, community center in general, maybe some sort of open house to get people reinterested and come back and see what new improvements we've made. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Several notices and they no, didn't no, respond. I mean that I, I, 
I'm just I'm not understanding why the property owner has failed to do anything about it. I don't know. I, so we, we had a meeting with Block and Company on our ongoing litigation last week, and that was one of the questions that we asked them. Um, they have been non-responsive to our request. Initially in January, they um, had indicated they were in the process of getting bids to have all of that replaced, and then it just sort of stalled out. What they have indicated to us, um, and we actually connected them in this meeting with Dave Martin, was that it was a truck driver, a delivery truck for the Dollar Tree store uh -huh. that backed into that, and they actually, I think, have video footage from Hy-Vee that pr pretty clearly demonstrates that. Um, and they were moving along the path with having the insurance carrier replace that, and then things have stalled out okay, so with that. So issue. their block and company, rather than go out of pocket, was trying to get uh, the insurance company to take care and make the repairs. Um, you know, part of what we have communicated to them is, I mean, we understand that, but um, right. ultimately, it's your property. You need to, you know, bring it into compliance. So well, Olivia, she they never communicated that back to us until the meeting. So yeah, um, for the same thing. I did have a definitional question. What is an accessory animal permit? Chickens. Chickens. Chickens, and bees. Bees. Okay. Chickens and bees. Yeah. All right. Um, how much time does somebody have from the time we issued the first notice to respond back before we would take any further action? It depends. Typically with grass, it's like a week. And that's the most common. So if they don't have it knocked out within a week, then we're back on them again. If it's a couple of weeks, we'll go in a week. What if it's just like an exterior problem? That might be 30 days. So if it's like peeling paint or something like that. Too much stuff in the yard? Um, again, it kind of depends. You know, usually, maybe a week or two, kind of depending on the situation. And then if that doesn't get addressed in that week or two, what, what's typically the next step? It's a follow-up notice. Hey, you know, we sent you this notice a couple of weeks ago. We drove by yesterday. Nothing's been taken care of. Where are we at with this? And how many follow-up notices you know, before we would typically have to take it to court? Usually about two to three follow-up notices. Which could be the length of a summer. It could be, yeah. Um, you know, some things, you know, if it's like grass or something, we're going to get on and get abated. Uh, is there a requirement set in stone that tells after so many days or after so many, we're going to go ahead and abate the property? Yeah, once, so our process, and I know um, when I met with Kristen and Sully to do agenda review, they had some good questions about can we just get a primer on the process? And so, Brian and I had talked about that today. So we'll kind of work on getting something that, that helps outline that. But you know, oftentimes when we say we send a notice, that first notice isn't the legal notice that goes via certified mail. And so that's sort of our first approach. And so we can kind of map out on a, on a typical case how long that takes. And then if we don't get compliance there, then we move into sending the certified notices. And then that really kicks us into that statutory uh, time frame that's that's stricter in terms of um, when we can come in and abate. We we can't really go in and abate until we've started that process and allowed sure, yeah. those time frames to run. So there's kind of two. Pro we do kind of the code encouragement <coughs> process first and hope that we can get um, compliance with that. And and just listening. I mean, one of the things that we hope to do is by expanding these and talking about them um, in a with more statistics than just a week at a time, it would allow us to maybe look at, and we can certainly add detail at that, but just it, as I'm listening and, and as Brian was talking, I no, noted to myself, you know, we, what we may want to do is if we have the ability to track how many uh, people comply on the first notice versus the second notice, to kind of help us gauge, um, you know, if, if that process is working or, or where we might have some opportunities for process improvements. Well, Along you those have to lines. Send a second notice. They, didn't comply they did not first. comply, <laughs> yes. So the biggest concern I have is either trash around the house or grass, because that is potentially limiting our ability to turn houses over. What if somebody has a house for sale on the street and they've got a couple houses that are right. just letting, by the time we get notice, it's two or three months. Is there not a way we could, on some, we could just make a phone call and say, I don't know if you know, but we'd really like to work with you on this. If you can't do it, please let us know by close of business at the end of the week so we can do it. it it's just not fair to the neighborhoods where the people are really trying to keep their properties up. And I, I we don't want to turn into the federal government. Believe me, I've worked for 35 years and it has goods and bads. But especially stuff that 
over a summer time where you've got you know, rain and sunshine and heat, where the grass is really growing. Somebody just moved into a house two doors from me, and the grass was two and a half feet high. And I sent my son, I said, he'll cut your grass. You know, he'll do it for free. We just got to keep the neighborhood up. Right. Anyway, they finally came and cut the grass yesterday, and it looks totally different. Yeah, but what about grass? I mean, mowing. It's, I mean, you can't wait a whole summer. So I'm no, assuming... that's something we're on pretty quickly. Okay. They don't respond by a few weeks. We'll, we'll go ahead and pay them. We'll, that's typically what those abatements are. We hire a company to go in and mow the grass. Okay. Okay. And if they don't pay that back to us, we we'll take that tax bill. Right. So, so we don't... I know there's some properties on the lawn that seem to struggle. It takes a little bit of time to give that legal notice like Laura was talking about. But for usually, a mowing violation, you still have to do the legal notice as well. Okay. Typically. But the, once you do that, that's like a two-day or two-week right. turnaround in terms of giving time to respond to that legal notice. If they don't, they get a company in there. So it is that they could be up to, for a mowing violation, it could be up to maybe a couple of weeks, three weeks, yeah. two weeks. Two, three so weeks. They want a 52nd and outlook, if you're familiar with that one. They uh, finally did get that cleaned up mm -hmm. Friday and over the weekend. I think got the grass mowed. But that, that grass in that backyard was almost as high as a four foot grass, maybe mm -hmm. three feet tall. The challenge has been a wet, humid spring. So and, the grass is a small And that owner, which is another problem. Yeah. I, had a, I had a question about the encouragement the encouragement process before the legal notices are sent on some of these things that are kind of you know seasonally dependent etc is there less of that part because it sounds like after the legal notice is sent they still have a time period in which they can remediate it while avoiding court um, so I was just kind of curious about the discretion on the Encouraging before the, <laughs> before the formal notice. Well, and again, yeah, it's it's always a little bit of carrot and stick. You give them a notice, and with grass, if they don't respond within a few days, you know, we'll send out that that formal notice to kind of get that clock ticking. Okay. Um, you know, if it's something like um, peeling paint or some exterior issues. That process might take a little bit longer. We might kind of steer towards some of our programs that right. we offer. Hey, you know, hey, we can give you pain at a reduced price, or you need help with a contractor, we can get that set up for you. But the right. things that we're going to get out of hand quickly, like the grass, we get on pretty quickly. But I think the primer's a good idea. We should probably detail that out in mm -hmm. the primer, bring that back in the next quarter. I have a question. Can you distinguish, you maybe you've already said this, uh, between what is proactive and so proactive is what we observe when we're driving in the neighborhoods. So you initiate. Yeah. Okay. And the complaint will be received. Based on receipt. Yeah. And this may be a question for John and, and the chief, but if you've got branches that are covering signs and they're, they're creating a hazard for traffic, how is that in terms of obstruction of view and intersections? How is that? Um, we typically just take care of those. Yeah, sometimes John will take care of those. Sometimes we'll notify the property owner because the site distance, the triangular site distance issue. Yeah. We'll cut back their bushes or something. Okay. Yeah, we'll tell them if it's on private property. If it's in right away, typically John's folks will take care of it. Okay. So stop signs, especially yeah. uh, speed limit signs. We'll we'll go out, and trim it back. Okay. You'll do it, the, the property owner does it. Well, yeah, we'll just, we'll just go ahead and do it. I mean, for us, it's, it's a lot easier to just go ahead and eliminate it than it is to, to go, through the process. go through the process. Unless it's something that's just out of hand. Right. But, you know, like Brian alluded to those site distance issues. You, know, you pull up to a street and you look and you can't see because somebody's vegetation is growing right. so far out that it obstructs your view. Brian, the second biggest category up there is miscellaneous. Is there anything that is big enough that needs to be broken out? It looks like it's getting pretty big. Yeah, that kind of jumped out at me as well, especially in the first quarter. I'm not really sure what's driving that. Um, what would be included in miscellaneous? Might typically be like storm debris. Or it's also, and I can tell you only because Brian and I work. We've been out of the office at different times, but I asked James that same question because it was big. He said, in that category, it's uh, people leaving their trash carts out longer than they should be. 
And so I, I had asked James, is there a way to break that down? Because there may be some things that we can do additional education on articles in the newsletter, um, and the trash carts seem to be the biggest offender in that miscellaneous category, which I would never have kind of, <laughs> but that's one that sort of goes unnoticed, but they do get a lot of calls on that. Where are the dead trees? <laughs> I don't know. The dead trees, I don't know if dead, dead trees are probably in miscellaneous. I don't know if they're news well, I think that really jumped up last summer with the storms. We had a lot of storm damage. And, uh, yeah, the first quarter, I'm not really sure why they'd be so high. Any, any other specific kinds of violations that you're interested in seeing or tracking that we might be able to sort of call out of the general data? Do you have any kind of breakdown between residential and commercial? Yeah. Yeah. Is vehicles just vehicles where they shouldn't be or junk yeah. cars? Okay. Typically the inoperable vehicle. That's a great example where somebody got a notice and they're coming up on their window of complying they called on Friday afternoon, James and Neil were both out, so I took the call, the guy's not working on it. I just I gotta get the tile from the state. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's fine, you know, we're not we're not wanting to take you to court, we just want the car gone. He said, so do I. I said, okay, <laughs> no, no, we'll give you another week or so to get it done. So in operable vehicles, is that on private property as well as public property? I mean, what if you've got maybe a nineteen fifty three Buick that's parked in the <laughs> tattoo part of a parking lot that hasn't moved since 1954. Well, then we're contacting the tattoo part of the owner and telling him, you got a car there that needs to be moved. Uh, but it's primarily private property. Yeah. Every once in a while, you have an optimal car sitting on the street. That kind of falls into the police department's realm. It's right away. So we'll call that. It may be a recently, uh, John has advised they're going to be starting tomorrow evening, is that yes. um, correct? Uh, also, the Planning Commission at the May 29th meeting <coughs> the final site plan approval for the tidal wave car wash, so that that does not come back to you all, um, but that is through the process. And then I will let Emily give a plug for do we know what tomorrow is? Yeah. Yeah. Market opening day. <laughs> so we'll have an email um, tonight, I think. Um, for the first market update of the season, but we just thought these were so pretty that we should just show you. Oh, 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 oh. So it'll be on sale, and you know where, tomorrow from 4.30 to 8. Um, we'll have older styles available too at a discounted price of $10. So we made the stall list today, and it was really exciting um, for us to first see it in print. Um, the lineup is going to be, I think it will feel different, and like you have to go, it's going to be enough new people that you'll have to meet them and you know, look at what they have to offer and try and sample and we'll have a good mix of ready to eat and traditional farm things. But I think the key talking point when people, I mean, I think we're going to have a lot still of people with their um, nostalgic feelings about what they knew and loved. Um, it feels to me like a, a different animal. And I think, you know, we did, we did change it from Mission Farm and Flower Market to Mission Market. And I think it's really opened up the possibilities for what it is. And I think it's a community night. There's some great things for sale. We still have farm items. We'll have, not next week, or not tonight, not tomorrow, but next week, we expect to have farm fresh eggs, um, plentiful supply. Um, we'll have grass-fed beef. We'll have some produce. But it's limited. I mean, other things are, like the kombucha we have now that's new, all kinds of new bakers, kettle corn, that kind of stuff. So we're sort of trending more the less like fill up your grocery baskets for your week's worth of items, but also um, really high quality stuff that you'll still want to try. So I think I think that's kind of going to be a shift, but I don't think that that's a bad thing. Still wildflower baskets or wildflower bouquets. Um, we're working on the crafts. We didn't get quite the same level of response that we were hoping. Um, we have more that are coming, um, and that's a key message too. That this is just a start, but word of mouth is still spreading, and we're still working every week to add new and keep the variety up and keep. Interested. We're, um, we do have
have the third Thursdays booked for the food truck nights, so those will also be kind of the same, the dates, but the June 21st, the July 19th, and September 20th, and then the food truck party that's associated with the Sunflower Festival on that um, Friday, August 24th. Um, so those will have the beer garden, we have the bar, and new this year, Salsa Grill signed on <laughs> to provide us with a Mexican flair for that as well, um, with the bigger bands and the um, bigger food trucks. But it is a night at the market, but just plus. Um, so that'll feel, I think, really full and fun. Um, then we are talking with a, a vineyard to have wine samples, and we're working that angle too. So it's kind of a game in convincing them that the permitting will work and that they sure <laughs> can come and please do come and, and you get them. So we're going to try to fill in with more of that sort of adult beverage uh, attractions with distilleries or vineyards or those that are on the off weeks. But no promises yet for that because we are still making those contacts and developing that a bit. So I think really to share with the public, um, it's not the same thing, just move to the different night that we're kind of exploring new territory, but we did have the opportunity to talk to new vendors and that we would not have had the chance to talk with on a Saturday and that we seem like the interest is good and growing mm -hmm. and stay tuned and come often and buy things. Is there still a community hit? Is there still the community hit? There are. We don't have as many books. Like some of our regular hitters haven't um, come quite back yet. and. We have a few that have asked and we're booking them in. We've got several that we have worked with, but that calendar isn't totally locked yet. Um, our sponsorships, um, the daily sponsorships are filling in. We had someone um, do a monthly uh, monthly stall, so they'll be back each time for $150 each week, which is great. And then Main Street Credit Union is back as our presenting sponsor, and they'll be there once a month, too, to have that on-site presence. So we're sort of filling in the gaps. The musicians are almost booked, but for a couple slots, um, we still need ambassadors pretty solidly <laughs> throughout the season. I think people's schedules just aren't sort of set yet. But um, So if you know of anyone who would make a great volunteer, that would be a huge help for us right now. I, I noticed that is it Marion now has a Wednesday night. Yeah, 5 to 8. Yep. So is that a similar theme to ours, or is that just a continuation of their Saturday? I That's my impression. It's, it's a continuation yeah. of Saturday. Yeah. It's like Overland Park has a Wednesday and a Saturday market as well. That's not uncommon. Okay. But they don't have the Thursday as the new Saturday. <laughs> 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 is that on the back of the shirt? <laughs> <laughs> no, but we thought of it. Stay tuned. We bought a limited run of these. So we have lots of room to play for the rest of the time. Yeah. So these are just a medium. Yep, yeah, it's cute. And they're, they're, they're that blend thing, so it feels soft and good. So <laughs> yeah, I like the logo. The logo, like on the ads, that would be fun for a shirt, too. Yeah. The Thursdays. Yeah, I mean, I think we're kind of all in on the joke. So it feels, it feels homey. It feels like it's kind of our thing. So, thanks. Excellent. All right, well, that now does conclude the CDC report. Good job. Look at it, Meg. <laughs> well, then let's go ahead and go straight into our finance administration committee. So I'll call over the uh, finance and admin committee for Wednesday, June 6th. Um, first up, we've got a few action items tonight. And first up on that is the revisions to the council policy number 104 guidelines for city council committees. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, last month we had a discussion item where we talked about potentially making some revisions to uh, Council Policy 104, which is guidelines for City Council committees, um, to more specifically and clearly communicate how the public um, could, could come and comment uh, during our committee meeting structure. So staff had marked up the policy. Uh, Council Member Flora had suggested uh, some revisions to that, which we have struck from the version uh, which is in front of you this evening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think this really helps because it's really what we're doing. Right now. You don't have to show up to know; you can right. read it in advance and understand what the expectations are. So that's always helpful. So, yeah, consent. Or should it be discussion to clue people in the process? Yeah. Okay, so not consent? Not consent. That's fine. Okay. All right, second up on the list tonight, we have the resolution authorizing bank signatory. 
Brian, can you go ahead and update us on that? I think in addition to getting the market up and running, Emily's hired a new employee for the market. And so uh, this employee will be authorized to sign checks on behalf of the market. So primarily what we're doing there is we have a small account set up at the bank uh, just for the mission market. Uh, one of the programs is offered the mission market is SNAP, Supplementary Nutritional Assistance Program. So essentially those that participate um, will bring their food stamps to the market. They're given a token that says mission market on it that they can use to buy produce or items at the market. Then at the end of the night, those vendors can bring those tokens back to one of the representatives of the market and they write a check. So they just pay the vendor straight out and then we get reimbursed from the back end. So that's the account kind of accounts for all of that. So we're deleting an employee from last year, Janine Lamana. Yeah. <laughs> and we're adding Kate Deacon and then everybody else remains. So once this resolution is approved by you all, we'll initiate the paperwork of the bank to get that process going. Okay. Good. Are there any questions or go for Next action item for tonight is a resolution of intent to issue industrial bonds for the Mission Gateway Project. Yay! <laughs> so back in 2013, we had issued a similar resolution for the project, but with the new version and the new iteration, and the fact that we are seeing forward progress, um, we've been in conversation with the developer um, and their attorneys, and it's time to issue a new resolution of intent. Again, uh, this does not commit, but our development agreement that was approved in October of 2017 did contemplate the use of IRBs to give the developer access to the sales tax exemption on certain con construction materials and furnishings. Uh, so the first step in the process is for the city to consider the <coughs> resolution, which is, establishes our intent and authority to issue the IRBs uh, in an amount not to exceed $214,258,589, which is the estimated total valuation of the Gateway Development Project. So the actual bond issuance would occur at a later date. Uh, at, when that occurs, the issue may be resized. Typically, it's resized downward um, because not all of the project costs are eligible uh, for that process. They are not uh, a general obligation of the city, are not backed by our full faith and credit, so we do not have <coughs> any obligation to repay those. Quick question. Laura. Yes. The, has the valuation on the property in the end changed in the last two years or so? I haven't looked specifically at what's happened to the assessed valuation of the property. Um, it has fluctuated since, but, but the important thing for us at this point is going to be um, kind of that base year, and then whatever the valuation is going to be at 2019 when that TIF starts, clock starts to be. Yes. Yep. Okay. So resolution has been prepared by Gilmore and Bell City Bond Council. Is there anything preventing the bond issuance until the tax situation is cleared up? Or? Is that more about the building permits? It's really specifically tied to the building permits, but... Uh, building permits are tied to the, the yes, tax. You can't, bringing the taxes current. We can't issue a building permit until tax is paid. Okay. So the, I guess going back to the, so the bonds can be issued prior to the permit being issued. Well, that would be certainly be within your control. Yeah. <laughs> because it would have to come back to you. That would be a process that we would initiate. And typically, if if they aren't moving forward with construction, they're not going to come back and issue the bonds because they're the the developer is the one who buys the bonds back in that situation. So they're going to want to have work essentially underway before we would proceed with that bond issuance. In theory, I guess, if they could get the building permit, they can't really do anything in terms of construction until they have the bonds, right. whether that's because of the tax exemption on the supplies and materials. So what's coming first? Chicken or egg? Mm -hmm. the taxes, I, the I really think they need to have the taxes paid for 
the building permit, and then the bonds. And then they start the construction. So we don't need a contractual contingency because... It's already built into the development okay. agreement. And then, like Laura said, ultimately you have the authority to approve the bonds themselves. They're not going to go out and buy a bunch of material. They don't have bonds in place because they won't get the tax exemption. So go ahead and recommend that we approve this resolution. Uh, okay, for tonight. No, I take it to council. Take it to council. Yeah. I don't think this should be. Okay, not consent. Uh, yeah. Not consent. No, no, no. Not consent. Yeah. Uh, just. While we're on the top, have we heard any updates on the tax situation at all? Or is there any? We talked with Mr. Valenti last Friday, and um, he indicated they're, they are still on track to begin construction in September, and Good. so the tax payments would be made in advance of that. So awesome. His quote was late July, late early, July, early, July August, early August. For the tax payment. Check your promising news. Check the sale. It, it was not in, it was not in the distribution that we received uh, yesterday from the, from Johnson County. Brian and I both that's the first thing we go check, but it was not included in that distribution. But that's what he's indicated to us. So. I can say the plan review side, the uh, the architect did submit a second round of plans to us about two or three weeks ago. Third party firm that has season reviewing those. In fact, I got an email today from the architect saying where we at with that. So. They're anxious to get the plans back, the comments back for the second round. And we've also been working with the engineering firm that's representing Gateway on the right of way improvements and other things. So they're, they're moving along. Good. Yeah, progress we made. Okay. Uh, next up on the agenda tonight, we have a discussion item. Uh, item number four the review of the general fund budget and supplemental request for 2019. And what I might do at, at the discretion of the chair is I might um, ask if we go ahead and look at that quarterly police department update first, kind sure. of set that aside, and then we can focus our attention and kind of conclude this evening with the budget if that's all right. Well, we can okay. do that. After and I will ask. switch that up. So instead, we'll have that quarterly police department from mm -hmm. Chicago. Uh, police department update from Chicago. And by the way, Kristen, you cannot park cars in the street for more than 48 hours without being. So the antique car that's yeah. sitting there has two days to move. <laughs> but it's on a private parking lot. No, I know. Yeah. If it's on a public street, then it's two days. So mm -hmm. you can move it four inches and you're okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank April and May is not listed in here. So uh, but I'm going to start on the first page. Uh, a lot of times when we did the, the weekly report, it was, it was the same thing. You guys got a couple of the hot calls and how many alarms we went to. And this is a lot more statistics and the kind of crimes that we're seeing in, in our city and calls, things like that, that uh, is probably going to provide you guys a little bit more information. Um, the very first thing on there is calls for service. Um, if, if you notice the very last number for 2018, um, we started using what's called the CAD, Computer Aided Dispatch. Instead of us going through and actually counting the, the numbers on people's daily <coughs> activity reports, that's a lot of time, we go straight through dispatch. And we started that starting January 1st. Uh, so as you notice, if you multiply that times four, that is going to give us a lot more calls for service than normal. Um, what we can do in the future is break that down. Now, calls for service, uh, this is physically how many calls we ran in 2015, which is just over 10,000, and that's people calling in and saying, hey, I need something. The number at the very end takes everything into CAD, so if I go and I do a business check at CVS, that's a service that we provide. So I wanted to explain that to you guys, that the city's not burning down and going crazy um, through computer and dispatch. It's tracking everything that we do. Yeah, so it's it's not a that we are getting a lot more calls. It's nothing like that. Now, what we're going to do in the future is is uh, we just started that January first, and on the next quarterly report, you're going to see that we'll have 
the CAD part, and then we're going to actually have your calls for service so that we can track it both ways. It gives us more opportunity. We're not, Kirk's not downstairs counting everything on a piece of paper. So, uh, as you can start looking through, um, building checks, alarms, there's nothing on here that is, that is jumping out at me. Um, back in 2016, that's how many flight calls we ran. We ran uh, just under three a day. We're, uh, we ran about two a day last year, so uh, people aren't fighting there as bad a mission. It's a good thing. Um, our car checks have gone down for the first quarter. Uh, I will tell you that as of this week, uh, our traffic unit is fully functional. We have three people out doing traffic, one on every shift. Um, I have four people left in field training, and that's it. What is car checking overall? Traffic stop. Just traffic stop. Yeah. So um, you guys know how short we were for a while and running with three people and paying a lot of overtime just to cover the shifts, so things were getting better. So um, I haven't had any suicides this year. That's a good thing. So. Um, no, there's nothing on here that, that jumps out at me other than the fight calls have, have been dropping off, which is good. Yes, sir. Is, uh, is the suicide a subset of the death, death investigation? Or not? So it, it is. So um, under death investigation, and I have, this is what we call our monthly report. We generally don't put this out to the public or put it out to you. This has a lot of our information in it. Um, but like underneath death investigations, we have... Uh, attempted suicides, we have suicides, and then we have natural deaths. So, so far we've had zero suicides, and to be honest with you, we've had three people pass away in this city this year. So, I will also tell you that we, uh, we've also had uh, five attempted suicides this year. So, when, when you look at it, and I'll be honest with you, um, we run mental health calls every single day. Some are just people that need help, and others are people that, that need to go to the hospital or suicidal. Is so, that a number we could have broken out by card? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and what I what I'm the subcategories of under death investigation or well, yeah, mental, just the mental health in general. Or we have probably or attempted suicides at least if, if the mental health can't be done. What, what well, that, mental what health. Does that do for us? I, mean, I just think we're thinking about other services and the so city is concerned about the information. We can probably look at how many calls the mental health co-responder attends with us is probably the best yeah. statistic okay. to track um, because that is a service that we pay for through Johnson mm -hmm. County, and so right. that's um, probably the best way to look at. And I know there's there's conversations about you know we were sharing one among seven cities. Seven cities. Um, and, and some talk about, you know, is the call load, uh, would it suggest that we would need to increase that? So we can certainly right, look yeah. at, I think that's probably a good statistic to add is how often is the mental health co-responder showing up as well. The fire rescue, that, that average is like 15 a month. Is it, if you have a house that's on fire and there's three people in your office, if that counts as three, or how, how that's many? One. That's one? Yeah. If, if there's a patient transfer from some yeah. fire medical group, uh -huh. that's... We, we go to that's those. So think EMS, rescue. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so every, think every time that the fire truck fire. leaves the station or an ambulance gets dispatched, then we go. So. What's All the right. difference between a suspicious person and being proper? So a suspicious person is somebody at Johnson Drive on Lamar that just isn't acting right or, or looks out of place. Prowlers are usually window peepers, uh, people prowling around uh, people's property and cars at night. First, uh, first quarter of the winter months, not real big on suspicious versus prowlers. <laughs> right, but I will tell you, usually uh, we, we get the prowlers. We get them when it's raining, snowing, cold, because they know that we don't like to get out of the car and get wet just like everybody else. <laughs> so. on, on the car checks, mm -hmm. those don't necessarily convert to tickets, right? Right. So it, it may just be your stopping a car for whatever Right. Yeah. So uh, I will tell you that about uh, one out of every three car stops that we do gets a warning. Thirty-three percent. So yeah, not everybody gets taken. Is there some other category of service calls that are represented here on this list? Or? Yeah. Because um, it's about a thousand calls short, actually. Do the math. 
Yeah, so we didn't uh, we didn't list animal calls on there. Um, about one out of every four animal calls that comes in gets handled by patrol officers if NEAC's not working or if they're busy. Um, fingerprint requests, those aren't on there. Those are people that want to come in and get fingerprinted downstairs. Um, we've had 111 of those so far this year, and that's somebody getting called back here to the police station and taking 15 minutes out to fingerprint somebody. So. Um, Open doors and windows, that's not on there. We've had 24 of those so far this year where if Ken says, hey, my neighbor's door's open, we go check their house for them. Um, Vacation checks? Resident, uh, yeah. that, that's included in residence check. Yep, residence checks. So uh, if Ken goes out of town, uh, we've done 234 of those this year. And you were saying re retail calls, but also we, like you were talking about if you go to CVS, it's also yeah. now recorded as a call. Yeah, so if the officer types in, every car has a computer, and yeah. the officer types in that I'm going to do a business check at CVS, then it gets That's logged. If they don't type on the computer, then it doesn't get logged. Yeah. So we're, we're very much on them about making sure that you're out on the Because if not, the GPS shows your car there, but we don't know if you're mm -hmm. on something. So. Ben, when you're looking at recruitment now, So in the past, there was no training at all. Every officer downstairs goes through a week of what's uh, crisis intervention training. So they spend 40 hours of with mental health responders on how do you how do you deal with. And it used to be, hey, if they've committed a crime, they go to jail. And jail's not always the right place for them to go. So um, every officer goes through CIT training downstairs. We're just noticing that the calls for service numbers don't necessarily Right. Yeah. Not. Not every. I haven't put every single thing on there. It would. It would go three pages deep. So uh, we just try and hit some of the some of the higher ones. All right. So. Chief, I noticed. Sorry. No, okay. I noticed the 2017 totals for drug activity seems a lot higher than 2016, 2015. Is there, you know, a specific variable that I, I don't know about, or is that just the way it was? It's, it's personnel. It, it's who's, who's working midnights, who's on what shifts. I will tell you Tanner Eddings, who uh, is still at Fort Riley waiting to go to Afghanistan. Uh, if we left him alone every single night working midnights, he would go out and find you drugs every night. So there, there are some people that have that ability to go out and they find it. Um, Tony Palmieri had that ability too, and he just got back to work at midnights. Get on that duty, and he was out for six months. So it comes down to if you're shorthanded and what personnel are where. Um, if you put me on midnights, I'm not much of a DUI hunter. I would go find everything but DUIs. Um, Ron Rigolis is good at DUI enforcement. He's on midnights. So it just depends on your personnel. Everybody's got different stuff. We have officers that know all the different people that are out on midnights. Um, and that, that's good. So you have to have a variety of people. If everybody went out and hunted drugs all the time, then there wouldn't be anybody on the street. Mm -hmm. So, yes? I have, oh, one other categorization mm -hmm. question. Are all the domestic violence calls within disturbance? Or where are they categorized? No, so disturbance is basically just, it, it's a verbal or a physical altercation. Okay. So if you and Hillary are arguing at each other, that's a disturbance. <laughs> so I will tell you that this year we've had I believe it was, um, we've had 10 domestic violence uh, assault charges. Um, that doesn't show on this. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I, we don't want to put all this information out because some of this stuff uh, talks about uh, race and sex of the people that we're stopping and that kind of stuff. We've tracked that. It's not state law that we do that. But we track that because I want to make sure that we're, we're not stopping a certain ethnicity of people or anything like that. You want it to be as close to what your, what your population and your residents are. And I will tell you that we're well within where our citizens are. So, because I watch that every single month. And we do it by officer. Would it so. be 
would it be helpful maybe to have something as a, a written staff report summary of the quarter in terms of how, how these numbers reflect the normal or lack of normal? What, what is highlighted? We, we go through and we try and pick the stuff that we think that you guys or the community would be most. Uh, most people, to be honest with you, aren't going to care so much about fingerprints at the station. No, no, I was thinking more in terms of a, a statement or a paragraph. So if you go summary. to the, the end of this report, right. so our, our biggest challenge, which is why we wanted to have the discussion, because it's good feedback and then we can figure out how to rearrange the report or create a report that better meets your needs. So if you look at that trends or issues category, okay. that's really what was intended there. Um, and and that's, I think, where, at least in, in my mind, in talking with the department, we talk about those things which are emerging where we need to either watch, um, we either need to do some public education or some other types of intervention. But that's kind of where we would add that narrative um, piece of that. Because there's like there's no trends uh, other than the calls for service I explained to you right now. Right. Now, let's face it, it's June and this ended the end of March. And some of the trends that we've seen since I've put out to you all about uh, car break-ins. Now we're 50% of the way there because people aren't leaving stuff in their cars, but they're not locking their cars. Right. So I got to get them to lock their cars. Um, but so I'm I'm prepared at the end of June. I usually have the stats by within the first week of July. Now that doesn't always necessarily work for the first Wednesday of the month, but I'd be ready to go within 30 days after that so that it would be more prompt for you guys to have this information. But the good thing is, is if there's something that you guys don't see in here that you want, tell us and we're happy to change it. So. On the investigated activities you mm -hmm. have, I, I don't know if you would go back to that or not. The question I have here is you have a signed and then clear and closed. In some categories, there are more items clear or closed than there are assigned. So I'm wondering, is there from, what, from previous periods? So do we have any kind of sense of how many from previous, like to date, have not been cleared or what? You know, what kind of volume of investigations are still pending? Yeah, so I, I will tell you that uh, under past chiefs, every single case has been assigned to a detective. And when you have three detectives downstairs and each one of them is carrying 150 cases, they can't get anything done. So if there's a past car gets broken into and we send the fingerprints if we get any off to the lab and there's nothing to follow up on and he doesn't have any serial <coughs> on a stolen cell phone and everything, that case isn't going to be assigned. It gets put as inactive until we either get a fingerprint back or he comes up with a serial number. Um, if we get a tag number because Pat's car was involved in stealing Dyson's at, from Target, then that case is assigned to a detective because we have a lead, we have a tag to go off of. And then we try and get the video and then we send the video out. We just had that the other day at Target. Stole Dyson vacuum cleaners, and then they went straight over to KCK and got caught. So that case gets assigned, and then we go and arrest those people when KCK gets done. So we assign as many cases as we can, but I want the I want the detectives to focus on those cases and not just assign them cases that there's nothing to follow up on, or they have a stack this big sitting on their desk. And but I think in this section we can add. I think we can add some data on clearance rates, which I think is what you're, you know yeah, total caseload. So a sense of total, total, total caseload case and then yeah. clearance rates. That's um, kind of where and I'm trying to separate out. There'll always be some overlap um, with the carryover in the case, but I right. think we can right. sort of like code enforcement, um, where there some come into compliance or go to court outside of the the quarter in which a violation or an issue may have arisen. So I think we can certainly add some okay. data there. Is there any way, and I don't want you doing extra work, sure. only if there's a way to kind of get a comprehensive picture of what an average police officer in a complex society goes through in terms of the reporting requirements, the time it takes to report, all the record preparation. Uh, is there a way to kind of get an idea of how long it possibly takes based on the most complex, what's the most complex scenario? The most complex? Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 are you, or are you talking about average? Are you, are you looking no, at No, I'm for a DUI, for instance. 
Now I will tell you that a DUI it takes about two hours to process. Them. And then if they're a Kansas resident and they Lynn gets stopped for DUI and he can get a ride home and has a valid license, you come pick him up and then he gets to go home. Wow. Right. <laughs> if not, he goes out to the jail. But I will tell you that the DUI paperwork takes about another three hours exactly. to do. So one DUI is going to take in about five hours that night to do, unless you're really good at it, which I'm not. Um, but then, yeah, you have to go to court. There's the DL hearing. You have trials that happen here, unless it's your third, and you have to go to the DA's office. And then you have all the preparation work that goes with it. So, so you may have some case work that extends three to six months. Yeah. And if they don't show up to court, uh, we have DUI cases sometimes that are waiting two years. And the other thing that we talked a lot about is trying to get better data from the county in terms of the average length of time spent on a call. Because if our, you know, our number of calls over the years, if you look historically, has remained fairly constant. But you know, that's one of those issues that we have to start to unpack as we look at manpower issues and staffing issues. Um, if you're, you know, if if you're running the same number of calls, but a call is now taking an average of 30 minutes instead of 10 minutes, that obviously has an impact on response times and staffing levels. Right. So we'll start to. Um, <coughs> to delve into some of those things. The other thing that I know um, in talking with Captain Self, uh, because I had some questions about being able to map or report some of the statistics by ward. Um, with the transition, I think um, we've, we're sort of in a period where we don't have that map mapping capability. We were doing some of that in our old reporting system, and as we're transitioning to the new, um, we, we haven't sort of kept up with that, but we do have that capability in the new system, and we'll look at can we provide that information so that we can get a, a picture of where the specific crimes are happening. So. Uh, That's something I'd like to see, Lauren. I know right. a lot of residents are reaching out specifically about where one crime. And um, it, I think it'd be good for the city to be able to reflect accurately and say, no, it just feels that way, or yes, you're right, or no, it's this month, or it's, or it's just the time of year. I think that would be great. Ben, are you aware of any, any tools or software programming that might help expedite some of that paperwork and, and help you guys from having to basically fill the same thing out on 10 different pieces of paper? Maybe, or? So this record management system niche is half the cost and twice as good. Uh, I just, I'm going to an executive meeting next Monday about it. It's a couple of months behind. We were supposed to start this summer, and it looks like it'll probably be this fall, but we want it to be right before we jump in and have sure. problems with it. And we are not the first ones to go. We were asked to be, and I said I'd rather somebody else do it. <laughs> you figure out the problems and then give us something that's mm -hmm. nice and polished up. So um, it should be easier. An accident report takes an hour and a half to do. Too long. Yeah, um, I know a lot of times there's just document entry that needs to be duplicate things that need to be filled out on this. Right. Same information over and over. And there are sometimes tools out there to help not just make that faster, but also make it more accurate too. Um, yeah, I'll tell you, iLeads is what we're using right now, and it is not user friendly sure, at all. Sure. So, so if there's anything you know that, that we should maybe consider looking to help you guys out, that would be definitely worth considering. Yeah, no, I, I think that's what we're going to. Sure. So, fingers crossed. So, um, I know we jumped around a little bit. Um, we went through uh, some of the investigation stuff. Uh, at the bottom of page three, uh, it talks about our accidents, uh, and I wanted to make sure to throw in there um, the biggest day of the week for accidents right now is Wednesdays. Shocking. Uh, highest frequency time is from 2 to 3 p.m. It's not even during rush hour. So, and then uh, accident location last year was 61st of Metcalf. Horrible, horrible spot. Uh, for the first three months of Sharmish Parkway and Lamar and 58th and Metcalf time with four accidents each. So, yep. Yeah, there's just, there's not a lot of merging space to get on there. So, yeah. And I made a note based on a comment you made, Nick. Would it be helpful to, if we could look at, and this would potentially come out of court, but look at in this traffic safety and accident review, uh, citations issued, so we have traffic stops, but then citations that are generated as a result of that. Um, 
and then DUIs is kind of a subcategory of that as well. Um, It'd be nice to, to see that. Okay. And, like and then. I don't know that we can put you that. Can just give us the names, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing too is, you know, adding narrative. Now that we are at, at kind of back to getting close to full staffing, it was funny. We had we had a question last night at a CIP committee meeting about what, what in the world are the police officers doing? They're stopping everybody down at Roll and Drive and Johnson, you know, Johnson Drive. So I'm, my guess was we have enough people back on the street to, you know, to do some of that more targeted enforcement. But this would be an area going forward in this report where we could give you some narrative too about, you know, whether it's Johnson Drive enforcement or some other places in town uh, where they've uh, spent some time and, and what sort of results they're having there. Now the reason for all those car stops, uh, Memorial Day weekend, it's clicker ticket. The state pays us over time and as RC found out last year, we did not do a seatbelt check lane this year and have people drive through and car chases and everything. We'll do that later. Um, but yeah, the state pays us to go out and stop cars that aren't wearing their seatbelts and write tickets for that. Yes. I noticed that Shawnee Mission and Parkway are going to be resurfaced, seeing it between Metcalf and Row. Are we? Are you going to have to do anything to, to monitor the traffic or potential accidents, considering that project is going to be starting at the here soon? Yeah, John, are they keeping one lane open? Each way? they are. Okay. Yeah, so once they declare it as a construction zone, they're probably going to reduce the speed limit and you'll start seeing the motorcycle sitting up there. Okay. So, because the last thing we need is a worker get paid. That's not any good. But traffic will back up on Sharmerson Parkway and we'll have extra people out since we're getting more fully staffed to, to watch that because the parkway is bad enough at rush hour, let alone with construction. Any idea how long that's supposed to take? No, no. Okay. So. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> Laura, are we going to cover the animal control while the chief's here, or how is that? We'll do that in the budget, and if we have other questions, we'll okay. come. But many of the things that he noted that, that are were not included in that list, the fingerprinting, the animal calls, are things that could potentially, are going to potentially be done by the CSOs, and so I think as we move forward, we're going to want to track those separately so we can understand the value uh, that, that we're getting there, but we can talk in more detail about that. Anything you need from us? Uh, people station. Uh, cooler weather. And tell people to lock their cars. <laughs> well, yes, please lock your cars. <laughs> and your doors. Like I said, we're halfway there, so people aren't leaving stuff in us. So, you guys have any other questions on stats, people? Appreciate it. Thank you. 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 So last week we had our community conversation on the budget and we had Mr. Arnett, who's also here with us this <laughs> evening, who was so good to attend uh, last night. But it did give us the opportunity um, last week to share with you all kind of just an overview of the departments, services, and programs that we provide. So uh, tonight my intent is really to focus more on the numbers. Certainly if you have questions about anything you heard last week, or other things related to the specific program services or statistics, um, don't hesitate to, to jump in and uh, talk about that. So tonight, we're really going to take kind of our first look at the general fund budget, and this is a draft. We're calling this a draft. It is not uh, what we have proposed at this point, um, but really a starting point for our conversation. I think as most of you know, the general fund is the city's largest fund, and it's where we account for all of the resources that are traditionally associated with uh, providing our services that aren't legally um, or by sound financial management practices required to be budgeted or tracked in a separate fund. Supports all the, the basic operating departments, 
including police, municipal court, public works, parks and recreation, community development, neighborhood services, administration, and our legislative services and programs. Every year, um, we face kind of a unique set of challenges as we develop the budget, and 2019 is going to be no different. Um, I was just at a luncheon this afternoon with Northeast Kansas administrators. Uh, there are about 50 in attendance, and it's the, the most well-attended meeting that we have each year because everybody talks about what's going on with their budgets. <laughs> Number of employees, merit increases, uh, mill levies, and not surprisingly in Johnson County, most uh, mill levies are being held constant or uh, in some cases rolled back slightly. Um, some of the larger cities are adding uh, significant numbers of personnel. Uh, revenues and resources are rebounding to the point where um, they're able to do some of those things. Uh, so I'll touch on a couple of those areas as we go through the report. But wanted to start with um, revenues in the general fund. Uh, you have some detailed information in your packet on uh, revenues. Total estimated revenues in our draft general fund budget are just uh, 13.08 million. Um, the other thing that I might, if, depending on which page you want to follow along, and so the detail is included in, in your packet. What I handed out this evening um, that talks about the general fund summary, there's one side that has a green bar across the top and one side that has a yellow bar. So if you look at the green bar side, this is your general fund summary with none of the supplemental requests included. This is, uh, as I look at the budget each year, this is my sort of general fund snapshot. This is the easy way for me to look at, at this and kind of understand and then see where we might want to delve into some more of that detail. One thing I've added on the right-hand side is a column which will show you a percentage increase uh, of the proposed or draft 2019 budget over um, 2018. And the, both the uh, revenues and expenses in the 2018 budget have been adjusted in, in some cases to sort of track our activity through uh, at least the first quarter um, of 2018. So the, they are estimates in many cases and not the budget amounts. So as I mentioned, the 2019 draft general fund budget shows total revenues of approximately 13.08 million or an increase of about 4% over the 2018 esti estimated um, that, as you can see uh, from the percentage column, is being driven in large part by increases in plan review and inspection fees, and we expect those to increase because of the development activity that's anticipated on the Mission Trails and the Gateway Project. So those uh, in the area, era that we're moving into in the next couple of years, we expect to be higher. You see corresponding expenses uh, associated with those that those will likely come, come down to more historical levels once those projects are uh, up and developed. Right now, um, one of the things that I know Brian is, is working on and focusing on is um, the property tax lid and the impact that that will have. Right now, you can see we're showing a very conservative, essentially no growth in uh, property tax revenues for the 2019 draft budget, even though um, we've the county appraiser has estimated about almost a 12% increase for us citywide. We will get our final valuation later this month. Uh, we don't have a sense at this point about how many appeals were received and what the final outcome of that. So we'll get a final number there. Uh, Brian was attended a budget workshop through the state last week uh, in which they spent a lot of time talking about the impact of the property tax lid. And, so that's really where our focus uh, in that area of property tax lids will be between tonight's meeting and when we come back in July. And I know Councilmember Flora had asked me previously some questions about can we t you know, talk in more detail about really how that works specifically. Um, and once we've had an opportunity to kind of turn all the levers and move all the gears and, and understand that ourselves, we'll certainly share that um, in, in July. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so that's, that's conservative. Uh, the sales and use taxes, um, we can continue to, taking a somewhat conservative approach in the budgeting. That's an area uh, that we really continue to perform well in. One of the, the other handout that I passed around this evening is a page out of the back of the comprehensive annual financial report that you all saw last month. Uh, and I, I think this is an interesting snapshot um, that just gives us 
kind of a by category a look at what has happened with our local sales and use tax collections uh, over the last several years. And so you can see um, we've had some pretty dramatic increases in 16 and 17. We knew that because of what we've seen happen uh, with additions and increases in our fund balance. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about this this chart is you can kind of see how our sales tax receipts are spread out across the various um, businesses and entities who generate sales tax for us. And fortunately, um, you know, unlike the city of Merriam, for example, where you have automobile sales, which would be uh, significantly higher, we're, we're pretty well balanced. Um, so I just wanted to share this. We didn't spend a lot of time looking at um, some of the statistical tables and charts in the back of the CAFR. Uh, but this is one that I that I find uh, is interesting. Now, again, this this is reflective of, as you can see below, our general sales tax, the street sales tax, and the parks and recreation sales tax. So, not all of these revenues are going to be translated into or shown in the general fund. Um, again, coming back to property taxes, uh, once we get our final valuation, right now, based on estimates, we. I uh, believe that one mil in our general fund for 2019 will generate about $150,000 uh, in revenue. In your um, packet, I included last year's. Uh, so this will obviously be updated um, once all the cities get through their budgets this summer. But for the current mill levies in all the cities in Johnson County and other taxing authorities, I think it's always interesting to kind of take a look at that and understand where we are in comparison uh, to that. Um, I might turn your attention just very quickly to that page. One of the things, and, and we will do this as we get um, work through kind of our final mill levy and establishing that. Um, we will also show you how we compare sort of total tax and fee burden because while our mill levy may be on the low side, we also have our stormwater utility fee, the solid waste utility fee uh, that our residents contribute. And so we want to look at uh, kind of that total tax burden. The other thing uh, that can, can get a little tricky when you're looking at a mill levy comparison is you have to think about those cities that include or incorporate fire services within their own city operations and, and mill levy versus the city of Mission or others who may participate and receive fire services through the consolidated fire district number two. So oftentimes you'll see us as we go through this process combining those mill levies to try to get closer to an apples to apples comparison. Uh, as I mentioned, we go to, sorry, back to the chart. So, uh, the big pie chart on revenues, yeah. So revenues by category, a couple of things uh, that are always important to know to talk about is one of the things that we look at as we build budgets and, and manage budget, budgets is revenue diversification. So you want to look at um, are you too heavily weighted and too dependent on certain uh, streams of revenues and, and what sort of elasticity or volatility exists within those various revenue streams. As we look, sales and use tax is at 26% of the general fund uh, revenues for 2019 uh, is our largest category. It's important to note here, though, although we've separated out intergovernmental revenue, that is also primarily sales tax. Uh, that is county sales tax that is passed through to the city. So, it, and, and then a small portion of that is an alcohol tax. So when you look at those two categories, we are still um, somewhat heavy in the sales, on the sales tax side. Um, but again, that's where you start to go back and look at uh, who are the sales tax generators in our community, how have we survived or weathered a recession in the past, how would we anticipate being able to respond to uh, the potential economic downturns. Uh, the, then the next largest category of revenues in the general fund budget is the property tax. Um, and you see for 2019 uh, estimating between real property and motor vehicle, about 2.7 million or 21% of our general fund revenues. It's important to remember that we're also reflecting collection of the uh, seven mills that we collect 
and then distribute to the capital improvement fund for street maintenance. It was the replacement for the transportation utility fee. So that's shown as a revenue uh, in the general fund. If you look at, at the sheet again with the green bar across the top, you will see that broken out specifically property taxes for streets, and then you will see it as a transfer out of the general fund uh, further down on the page. So that represents those seven mills, uh, or the equivalent of seven mills, uh, equates to roughly 38% of the real property tax that's collected. Um, so we're taking about 38% of that and dedicating it to street maintenance. Parks and recreation uh, is the next largest category um, of revenues. We are estimating um, a decrease in uh, <coughs> primarily community center revenues, which is the largest portion of that. The pool is also included there, but community center is really the driver in those revenues. We are continuing to see decreases uh, across our membership categories, uh, programs and classes, uh, and not so much in, in rentals, but overall uh, projected to decrease by about 2%. And when we start to talk about supplemental programs and services, uh, we've got some adjustments being made there uh, that we'll share some additional information on. The next category then uh, is, we've talked a little bit about intergovernmental revenue, which again is passed through county uh, sales taxes, uh, becomes fines and fees, uh, which are those things that are generated by the police department activity, which we were just discussing. Uh, one, we're at about 1.3 million uh, estimated revenue for the 2019 budget down significantly from our peak, I believe, about 10 years ago of about $2 million. So I think we've sort of found that um, spot, that, that comfortable spot in terms of uh, tr managing traffic enforcement in a way that focuses on traffic safety um, and kind of leveled out and, and kind of found that, that appropriate place in terms of revenue generation. Franchise fees are 5% uh, that's collected on all the utility bills uh, that's distributed back to the communities, and that's just a slightly over a million dollars for us every year. So gas, electric, phone, cable, uh, all of those kinds of things, you're going to pay a franchise fee. Uh, that's common in every city. As we touched on, then uh, the other revenue category, which is just about 8% of the general fund revenues for 2019 includes all of our licenses and permitting, so business licenses, occupational licenses, plan review and inspection fees, service charges, so that would be uh, charges for court services and a variety of other things, and then all of our miscellaneous and other charges, uh, primarily in the miscellaneous and other category we're going to be looking at interest. And again, those are detailed uh, in the revenue detail pages that were included in your budget packet. So if you have any questions about any of those specific uh, categories or line items. Um, again, biggest driver on the revenue side or biggest increase is in the plan review and inspection fees where we're estimating about 126% increase uh, over 2018 estimated. Uh, right now we have currently proposed or not considering any new revenue sources uh, included in the 2019 draft budget. We also have not included anticipated revenue. You may recall from the Mission Trails or EPC redevelopment agreement that uh, we negotiated some upfront dollars with that. The first $250,000 in total, the first $100,000 comes with issuance of their building permit. So based on the schedule that, uh, that they're on in terms of demolition and construction, we would expect to have $100,000 coming to us. Um, we aren't showing it here. Um, when we have that in hand will be the appropriate time for us to have a conversation about how best to allocate those resources. As we've talked about before, um, we've really made continued progress in rebuilding uh, the general fund fund balance and achieving that 25% fund balance goal that's established by council policy. Again, if you look at this uh, snapshot with the green bar across the top and you go to the bottom, you'll see um, an unrestricted fund balance at the bottom of uh, ending in 2019 of 1.2 million dollars. If you go just above that, um, we're going to we're we're showing fund balance differently than we have in previous years' budgets. Uh, you may re remember as we walked through the CAFR process, uh, we can restrict or assign or commit resources in that fund balance. Uh, 
what we are showing here is restricted uh, fund balance at, at that 25% uh, fund balance goal. So you see that 3.2 uh, million um, is incorporated in an, a true ending fund balance of 4.6 million and then also $135,000 in ADA fees that have been collected over the last uh, 8 to 10 years. So when we, we kind of check, put a check in the box that says we've met our 25% fund balance goal um, and we have $1.2 million in excess fund balance um, that we estimate to be available as a part of the 2019 budget. Any questions about revenues, revenue categories, revenue estimates? Um, so then we move on to the expenditure side, and um, we talked to in the past about approaches to budgeting, and while we don't take a zero-based budget approach, we do take a look at each of our line items uh, annually as we evaluate them and, and walk through those as a part of the budget development process. And over the years, we have used a variety of tools to bring the budget into balance. We are required by state law to submit a balanced budget at the end of the day. Um, and so we have looked at eliminating positions, um, reducing, freezing, eliminating merit increases for employees, delaying the purchase of capital equipment, eliminating or reducing non-essential budget items, uh, and privatizing or outsourcing services to sort of achieve efficiencies or economies of scale. None of those are favorite things that we have to do, um, and, but important tools. Uh, but over the years, as we've applied sort of all of those techniques, I think that um, our budget has gotten pretty lean uh, and pretty efficient. Maybe too much so in, in some cases. Um, so as we look at 2019 draft general fund expenditures, um, it's actually kind of Sorry, there. Uh, it's only 11. It's about an 11 percent increase over the 2018 estimated. Again, you can see that on the snapshot page with the green bar. So, the increase in expenditures again is being driven primarily by the um, what we take in in plan review and inspection fees. We pay out in plan review and inspection fees. So you see an increase there. We've had. Um, 2018 was a fairly light year in terms of capital equipment purchases for the departments. 2019, which we'll discuss in, in more detail here shortly, uh, was much uh, larger in terms of the amount of capital equipment uh, estimated to be replaced, so you saw a, a big increase in the capital outlay. Uh, and then we realized as we went through the budget that because of some staffing issues that we've had, we have had dropped a position out of the Public Works Department that had in theory, been budgeted, but we hadn't been carrying that in the salary. So that's been added back in. Um, the personnel services expenditures estimates at this point, um, we have planned for about a 3% merit pool increase. Uh, last year, you'll remember that the council did approve several market adjustments coming out of a classification and compensation plan. Uh, we will take a look this fall as we go through. Uh, there was some money in this year's budget if we need to make additional market adjustments, but um, looking at that 3%, that's pretty uh, standard. I heard anything today at my luncheon from other cities from about a 2.5% to uh, the city of Leeville looking at about a 5% increase. So um, we are certainly right in, in the hunt um, and remaining competitive, but now that we've got that uh, classification compensation study uh, and that plan, we will uh, get back to and have the tool against which to benchmark up with the, the um, market. The personnel services line item also includes at this point a 20% increase in health insurance benefits. Uh, based on, you may recall, the kind of situation we found ourselves in last year with some pretty dramatic increases. Uh, now is the time to build that in. Uh, we won't know until probably mid-October uh, what those rates might look like, so there could be some flexibility there. We would hope that it would certainly be less than, than a 20% increase, but uh, that allows us to be conservative now as we go through the budget process and then realize some savings if we are able to do so. Question, Laura. Uh-huh. 
when we did the insurance renewal discussion last year, we talked about not having the insurance company wait until the last second to kind of give us trends. Is this about the time that they should be giving us a trend update for trending poorly or trending well? We should, if I am remembering my calendar correctly, a week from yeah, Friday, Friday. We, we have yeah. a meeting okay. with them for kind of that mid-year touch base. Okay. Absolutely. I was thinking today I need to send an email to them and ask them for that information. Yes. So when we look at kind of the, the base or draft general fund expenditures by function, uh, kind of detailed in the graph on page four of uh, the first memorandum, not surprisingly, public safety, which includes the police department and municipal court, is the largest uh, e expenditure by function at 4.4 .4 million. Uh, public works, which includes public works, community development, and neighborhood services, comes in at about 3.5 million, or 29% of the base expenses. Parks and recreation comes in at 23%. That includes the community center and the outdoor pool. And then administration, which is our general overhead account, legislative budget, and the administration budget uh, comes in at about 12% or $1.4 million. Is the court system under public safety or administration? It's under public safety. Uh, <coughs> you had detailed line items in um, your packet. It's always. Um, I am happy to move into kind of capital and supplemental, or if anybody has any specific questions or other line items that they know they have now, we can certainly address those. Okay. I'm going to move into the second memo, which thank you for your patience and uh, getting that pulled together. But first, we'd like to talk about sort of the capital equipment that's included in the general fund. Right now, 100%, if you look at the snapshot with the green bar again, 100% of uh, the 2019 capital equipment for each of the operating departments is reflected here as no transfers in from um, our equipment reserve and replacement fund, which we established several years ago. So very quickly running through uh, capital equipment. So you can see capital outlay uh, for the 2019 draft budget is about $684,000. It, it doesn't look like as much of a dramatic increase over the 2018. Uh, if you go back to a budgeted figure there, um, it's going to be much lower. But if you, if you come down to the bottom of the 2017 actual column and the ending fund balance that is assigned, you'll see a number $346,192. Those are the carryover funds for $226,000 roughly for cameras, phone systems, and the wiring, which we've uh, approved this year and are moving forward with, as well as $100,000 for financial management software and $20,000 for computer replacement that did not occur in the 2017 budget. So that number has been rolled up and expensed in the 2017 budget. So in administration, uh, the request is for replacement of a laptop in public works. Uh, public works department has a crew cab truck replacing a 2006 model that's used for asphalt patching and street maintenance activities estimated at about $70,000 with the trade-in or resale value of the existing vehicle at about $15,000. An extended cab truck, again, replacing a 2006 model used for hauling and other maintenance activities, and this is also a vehicle that's used in our snow removal activities. So the estimated replacement cost for that is $75,000, again, with a trade-in or resale value of the existing at $15,000. Uh, the International Class 7 truck, which is one of the large trucks, reflected in its price tag of $185,000, um, is used for heavy hauling and again is one of our snow removal uh, vehicles. Uh, again, also a 2006 model. So um, the department, those are the big, the three trucks are the big items in public works. Uh, they're also looking at replacing a leaf, leaf vacuum that's used to take leaves from the inlets channels uh, and other areas that we can't easily get to with our mowers. Time to replace the portable messaging boards that are used for traffic control and other public safety um, 
and public messaging components. We're looking at replacing those with boards with similar capabilities, but ones that um, can be programmed by John or Brent sitting in their offices as opposed to driving out, hooking up to, and standing in traffic to get the messages <laughs> changed on those. Uh, two boards uh, with an estimated cost of $40,000, and then a walking saw, which we use for cutting pavements and, and curb. Community Development Department is also requesting uh, replacement of a laptop. <coughs> and the Community Center, uh, none of their capital needs are reflected in the general fund budget. Those will all come forward and we'll discuss those in detail as part of the capital improvement program next week when we meet. The Police Department, uh, the request, the biggest request in the Police Department for 2019 is replacement of the radio system. That's being driven by federal mandates related to encryption frequencies, uh, which will take effect. And um, this is typically we replace and departments replace their systems in response to regulations coming out of the FCC. The last time we replaced our system was in 2010. Are we eligible for any grants? We will look, but they've mm -hmm. dried up in a lot of cases as it relates to, I think we had some grant assistance in 2010 when we acquired the system, but I don't think we found. Everybody went through Jobs County through their grant. Uh, everybody's on their own, and there's two different models of radios to get. But we're actively looking for grants right now for next year's purpose. So, so this upgrade would um, basically allow all of public safety departments across the county to communicate with one another. And I think this is particularly, I think your difficulty is on tactical channels and tactical operations right now. So this would improve communications on those tactical type operations. Um, the upgrade would replace both the handheld units and the units in the cars. So 40 handhelds, 18 mobile units, and all of the related microphones and earpieces and all of that. We're estimating a cost there of about $225,000. Certainly we can turn over some grant funds. Um, we will do that. Uh, the police department has also been trying to budget to replace about 20% of their computers annually in order to keep up with estimated life expectancies. And so uh, they budgeted $21,000 to replace 14 of the oldest computers in the department. Uh, they have one vehicle that's scheduled for replacement. It's a 2011 Ford Explorer, which is assigned to the investigations unit at an estimated cost of about $41,000. Radar units, we budget uh, both for radar units and handguns and shotguns uh, each year just to keep our inventory sort of rotating in, in good condition and making sure that we have uh, some surplus. So as I mentioned, all of those expenses are currently shown in uh, the general fund. As we continue to work through the process, one of the conversations that we'll have is what is, is there an appropriate portion which can be shifted either to the equipment reserve fund or that we want to make a transfer back in to assist with some of those costs. Any questions on the capital equipment requests? Okay, so then we have our supplemental uh, programs and requests, and there's not much to see up there, so I think it's fine. Um, and these are really split over both the current budget year and the 2019 budget year. Some things, um, we'll, we'll touch on this. So the first is a vehicle for a building official. As Brian mentioned, I think the last time we were together, we are currently in the process of recruiting for a building official. Um, once hired, that individual will need a, a vehicle to be able to go out and perform their inspections throughout the community. Um, it would be similar to what the Neighborhood Services Department is uh, currently driving. Um, it, in addition uh, to not having wear and tear uh, and potential damage to a personal vehicle with the equipment that this uh, individual would be carrying, uh, it also provides another presence. One of the things I think we forget about is that whether it's public works vehicles, it's not just the police vehicles in our neighborhoods that create that sense of another set of eyes and ears and that presence. And so certainly neighborhood services and, um, and this vehicle would help contribute to that. If we're successful in, in finding a qualified candidate and hiring that individual in 2018, we would recommend uh, purchasing that vehicle in this budget year. Um, there's <coughs> the estimated cost of that is about $30,000, and there's no vehicle to trade in currently, so there's no estimated trade in or resale value. Who would that person be assigned to? It would be in the Community Development Department, so Brian. 
would it anticipate that this person would eliminate all the outsourcing that would ever? Well, well, not completely, but not drastically reduce it. Right. Yeah. What percentage? Rough. Just 50%, 75%, 20%? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would hope with the with the major projects we have on right now, probably 25 to 30%. But this person gets up to speed, we can kind of face the outside folks, kind of wean them off a little bit. Uh, I would say probably 50% to 80%. So this would primarily eliminate the contract that we have now with IBTS. If we continue to get the larger scale development projects, we will likely, again, it kind of is that staff capacity issue. Uh, if you remember some of the building permitting activity that you saw in Brian's presentation last week, those numbers, um, you know, the residential inspections and, and certainly uh, many of the commercial inspections could, could be shifted here. Yeah, it's, it's going to be hard to determine what type of workload we have because obviously we have two development projects currently, you potentially have the Marble apartment buildings. I anticipate there's going to be a lot of synergy from those projects. So there's going to be a lot of tenant finishes elsewhere, other activity going on. And then we just have all the residential things. It's, yeah, lots of folks want to replace their decks or put a sunroom on the back or place the hot water heater or the roof. And those are all things we do inspections on right now. And that used to be kind of run the mill stuff. Now you have three projects laid on top of it. So it's finding somebody with the right skill set, balancing their workload. So, no, I don't know if we'd ever completely go away from IBTS. We certainly shave off our usage of that. Next, we're recommending an update to uh, the space needs analysis for City Hall and the Police Department. Back in 2009, Needed a space needs analysis, um, which was really being driven at the time by the size of the municipal court dockets. We were frequently over fire code capacity here, the number of people in attending court and in the council chambers. Um, and so we, we did take a look at um, primarily the impact of municipal court and the efficiency of workspaces in the upstairs portion of City Hall most directly in that study. It also looked at ADA accessibility issues, which we know we have uh, throughout the building. Um, the study came back with about $400,000 of improvements, um, and none of those recommendations were implemented at, at that time. Um, How much did that study cost again? Uh, I don't remember. Like 30000 or something? The study that the update that I don't remember the cost. I think that was roughly. Yeah, I think that was roughly the cost. It may have been a little bit more for that study in 2009. The costs estimated here are based on a lot of that. Um, a lot of the data is compiled um, in the 2009 study. <coughs> to kind of start from that from that point. So I think it's a little bit of a reduction. You know, one of the things that we were looking at, and we looked at a variety of options back in 2009. There was at one point in time in which the city was looking at purchasing the old Pyramid Life building and converting that to City Hall and the police station. Um, and so there were a lot of really moving parts and pieces. Um, it, and then we saw kind of a change in philosophy in terms of the number of citations being written, which had a, a dramatic impact on the number of court patrons that were coming. And so that driver of the 2009 study, or the primary driver at the time, uh, was changed. and, and our uh, focus shifted. And so while that um, sort of spatial need doesn't exist any longer, uh, there are still a lot of demands from City Hall and public safety that need to be addressed. Uh, one of the ones that is, um, in addition to the ADA requirements, which is a very large one, uh, is a shift in kind of the diversity in the police department, and particularly the locker room space and the adequacy of that uh, for both our male and our female. So we're recommending that we actually issue an RFQ in 2018 to update that study uh, and make recommendations based on both our current and future needs. Part of that consideration will be having to look at what do we think is the impact um, 
not just on the break, breakout of male and female officers in the police department, but what needs might we have for additional staff based on the developments that, that are going to be coming online in the next two to three years. Um, so we would really look at, and again, so we've got immediate ADA issues, we've got um, almost immediate at this point, I think some locker room uh, consideration issues in the police department, uh, and then just workflow and efficiency in the layout of this building. Mm -hmm. um, you know, storage is always going to be an issue, but I think um, one of the things, I think it was Councilmember Quinn who talked about when we were together in February talking about how sort of uninviting the customer service experience is when you come into City Hall and you're sort of, you don't know which window to go to and how people are segregated. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there, but obviously trying to think about if we're going to deal with it. I think our recommendation for a spacing analysis is does it even make sense for us with where we think we're going to be to try to work within the envelope of this building. We know we've done some evaluation this year that we can't structurally uh, add a second story. We've, we've looked at can we add a second story above the police department. Um, those things would, would really be cost prohibitive. So first we, need, we really need to know how much space do we need next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, and then can we do that here? Uh, since 2009, we've collected an ADA accessibility fee as part of our court cost, and that's this number across the bottom here. Uh, and the um, committed category in your fund balance adjustments, uh, that's just been growing, and so we would actually recommend uh, taking the $30,000 for an updated space needs analysis uh, from those ADA funds, because ADA is going to be a primary focus of that study. Um, next we have the proposal to uh, bring two community service officers online in the police department. This is something uh, that we've talked about uh, for the last couple of years really through the budget process, but as our conversations have continued with the Northeast Animal Control Commission uh, and, and what we think is really provides the best value uh, for our residents at the cost that we were providing it is our recommendation that the city look at withdrawing from the Northeast Animal Control Commission effective uh, January 1st of 2019 and hiring two full-time community service officers who would be able to provide not only animal control services for the city of Mission, but also a number of other peripheral services within the department, fingerprinting, uh, some walk-in reports, uh, shuttling of vehicles back and forth um, as they're repaired or striped. Um, I can certainly go into, so since 1983 um, we participated as a member of Northeast Animal Control Commission and I think it was, has been uh, with the exception of probably the last uh, couple of years has been a really effective way um, to manage animal control services. What we've seen is our costs have continued to escalate. The per capita charges um, don't necessarily make sense for all of the participating communities and, and every year for the last couple of years we've had one or more communities who talked about um, pursuing and securing animal control services through a different mechanism so all of the member cities committed to staying on board for 2018 uh, and really looking at alternatives so we have spent the last couple of months um, walking through our CSO proposal, because one of the things that we realize is as the largest per capita contributor to NEAC, um, Mission's withdrawal from that, and as the operations and administration uh, are, that was going to leave a void potentially for the other member cities. And so one of the things that we committed to doing was as we looked at bringing forward the recommendation for community service officers that we would uh, also explore opportunities to offer that to the other cities on a contractual basis. So we put together uh, some cost proposals and then we refined our cost pro proposals. Uh, really looked at trying to transition, rather than a per capita model, we looked at a calls for service model. So we looked at the uh, average calls of service in the communities over a three year period to try to determine um, what's an appropriate sort of call rate because we think going forward that's a more appropriate or a better uh, way to estimate and charge the cost for the program. So there was a memo that went to the other member cities in NEAC <coughs> last month, uh, which was included in your packet, which had a lot of detail on how we put all of that together. But essentially, um, 
we are, again are recommending that we would bring two full-time community service officers uh, on board in the police department. Total impact uh, on the police department's line item expenses is estimated to be about $217,000. Uh, it does appear that there's an interest from the other member cities, uh, with maybe the exception of Roland Park, to contract with uh, Mission going forward. Each of the cities is kind of looking at their options in connection with their 2019 budgets. Uh, we did, the chief and I had an email from uh, Mission Woods this morning indicating that their council voted uh, last night to uh, for, enter into a contract. Now they are the smallest member city, but um, we think that is a direction uh, that we may be headed and just based on the feedback that we've had tentatively, um, we estimated that that Participation by Fairway Mission Woods, Westwood, and Westwood Hills would generate about $28,000 in annual revenue uh, to help offset the cost of services. If the City of Roland Park decides to come on board, that would add another $33,000 uh, to the revenue that would be available. So when we look at what we've historically budgeted for NEAC, uh, which was $82,000 in 2018, um, and the estimated revenues, the net increase in overall expenses is just uh, around $100,000, including a purchase of the vehicle, which is budgeted at about $50,000. Uh, the other thing that we're not able to show at this point is if the act is in fact uh, dissolved, the assets will be sold off, and then those assets will, will be returned proportionately to all the member cities. So there's likely to be uh, some revenue available to help offset the initial startup costs. Laura, I have one question about the fees, or the contract fees. Um, I'm sure it sounds like this has been a long process, but I was wondering why more of the cost wasn't being passed on, because it looks like almost all of the cities are going to have a big reduction in their fees and more expense for us. So I'm, just, I'm wondering about that balance. So if we looked at, and this is, we committed uh, that for anybody who would contract with us that we would certainly take at least a mid-year, if not multiple points throughout the year, review of kind of where we are in terms of service. But as we looked at the hours that would be spent on animal control activities versus the hours that would be spent um, on other non-animal control okay. activities. So we actually estimate, we took the personnel costs for two full-time employees, um, and then we, we took 45% of that and allocated that to uh, time being spent on animal control activities. So we'll monitor that and it may go up or down, but that's kind of how we approach that, saying certainly not fair to charge the other cities for right. officers right. taking fingerprints in our station. Right. So that seemed to be a level, and, and uh, Councilmember Quinn was, is the chair of the NEAC Commission and has sat through all of these meetings as well. And so I think we've, that was one of the things that was a really um, point of negotiation and and I think the other cities are kind of comfortable with where we've landed yeah. at this point. Okay, that makes sense. Will they, will they reside in the police department or up here? They will reside in the police department. Yeah. Um, also included as a supplemental request, so uh, their um, full cost being shown in the 2019 budget, uh, if, um, if approved, by the council, it looks like we're headed that direction. I think it would be our recommendation to look at recruiting and hiring and trying to get uh, the CSOs on board before the end of the year. There's nothing necessarily magic about January 1st, um, other than um, certainly we want to look at and be able to communicate with the two existing NEAC employees what that transition to look like. Yes? How do issues get handled in terms of court, municipal court? In there, in other cities, but they were doing service contract service to other cities. Will those be handled in throughout court? No. So two options uh, that we've talked about and are kind of exploring with the cities. So uh, we could, as a part of the interlocal agreement, allow um, our officers, it's my understanding, to write the, the ticket so the CSOs could write a ticket in any city. Uh, some of the cities have indicated that they may want, if it reaches the point of writing a ticket, uh, that they would want their police officers to do that. So that's something that we would discuss uh, with any of the entities that, that might contract with us. Okay. Also then, in the 
for the true 2019 supplemental program request. We've talked about this before, but 2019 is a year which we will be due for an update of our direction finder survey. Uh, that's estimated to be at about $16,000. Uh, we've completed one in 2007, <coughs> 11, and 15. Um, it's a survey that's mailed randomly to about 1,500 households, and uh, ETC Institute uses a process which will ensure that we get a sufficient sample size for a statistically valid survey. This is, uh, again, I think has been proven a very valuable tool as we look at setting priorities and looking at what the residents uh, are interested in uh, each year or over a two or three year period. Also, we've included um, an update to the comprehensive plan. This is something that we've really talked extensively about for several years. Um, the staff-led uh, update was initiated back in 2015 and really just sort of died on the vine, primarily because of lack of staff resources to do that. Uh, the, the comp plan update in 2006-2007 was an outside consultant-led process. Uh, but we've talked about, you know, is it time to take another look? Is it time to really revisit our vision? Uh, are the projects that are coming forward uh, from the development community, how do those align with our vision? Can we articulate that vision? And so. Um, we have worked with some folks who do a lot of comprehensive plan updates to put together a scope of services, which was included in your memorandum uh, with an update, uh, an estimate of about $110,000 for a plan update, um, and then potential to consider an additional $30,000 to do a market study update, which would have more of an economic uh, focus. What types of businesses uh, do we want or might we be able to attract? A big one. It's, it's, you know, it's not an ongoing, although it's, we, we want to do the periodic updates. Um, it will just have a one-time impact. It's about a 12-month process. Um, and again, the cost, estimated costs are based on the scope of services, which is a very public-facing, uh, sort of public meeting intensive uh, development process for a comprehensive plan. Uh, yes? Um, an appendix C, which mm -hmm provides the scope of services, right? Yes. Um, it talks about the, uh, the advisory committee. How is the advisory committee then created and established? What's the process for that? Um, it just depends. In some cases, uh, we the planning commission has kind of shepherded that process. If it's, if it's a more narrowly focused comp plan update or revision, uh, when we started the process in 2015, we actually had a steering committee that was uh, comprised of representatives from all of the city's boards and commissions, uh, as well as business owners. And it was uh, a very comprehensive group, and, I, and our approach was very deliberate in trying to expand uh, the participation and the conversation from all sectors in that group. So it would certainly be, I think, up to the mayor and the council to put that group together, but um, that's what it's looked like in the past. We also have a supplemental program request for marketing services in the Park Recreation Department. Uh, as we talked about before, we are seeing declining revenues. Um, with the age of the facility and um, newer facilities coming online, uh, we really need some help in trying to figure out who we are and who our target audience is. Um, so the department has proposed to issue an RFQ. In fact, it's, it's pretty much ready to go to explore how best to secure marketing services. That may be through um, a staff person, it may be through uh, contractual services. What we really need to do first, though, is uh, look at what is what are our goals, what are our objectives. Um, we've estimated uh, about $30,000 annually with the goal of increasing revenue across uh, a number of the, uh, the various categories for the community center. Um, also looking at a part-time fitness coordinator at the community center. Uh, again, the competition from some of the other facilities um, is increasing and staff feels like if a part-time fitness coordinator would allow them to build on and expand their programs, um, and the position would be scheduled for about 20 hours a week uh, to help plan and schedule those activities. Estimating right now a uh, total cost at about $25,000 and that uh, class and program revenue might increase as much as 
forty to fifty thousand dollars annually with the specific attention dedicated uh, to this function. That is one of the things that a plan of fitness doesn't offer is classes, and so if we can put some renewed attention and emphasis on classes, that would be a, a really good growth area, growth opportunity for us. So I'm going to stop there. So the yellow side of your sheet, of the same sheet, is it went through and plugged in all of the capital and supplemental requests because if you're like me, you go to the bottom line and you say, what's my appetite for the reduction potentially in the fund balance? So you can see here, the two, two of the things I did is I it brought in, I left 100% of the capital equipment, so the 684, 852, in the general fund, and I brought in $100,000 uh, from the equipment reserve and replacement fund, which has about a $400,000 balance in it. So you can see with those changes, I, I changed impacted revenue on uh, slightly on the community center side, um, and then added all of the expenses that were shown for the supplemental programs. And you can see, if you go to the bottom line, we end up with an unrestricted fund balance of about $1 million at the end of 2019. So I'm happy to stop there, answer any other questions. Um, you know, the, the other target areas, if I look at this snapshot, one of the things that we want to look at is when I look at total revenues and the subtotal for expenses, um, we want to try to bring that balance uh, in every year. We don't want to be spending annually in terms of true operating costs more than what we are bringing in. When we look at what is causing us to have ex you know, excess expenses over revenues, we look at or those transfers or those things that can be adjusted, some of those then become the policy decisions. If you look at the amount of money that we're transferring out uh, for street maintenance or for the solid waste fund or to look at capital uh, purchases, that's where we start to really impact or change that direction of revenues to expenses. Again, I think $6,000 of the supplemental program requests or more that I would consider one time. Uh, obviously, the community service officer request <coughs> is ongoing and has much longer term operational impacts uh, anytime you bring a staff on. Um, you know, so, I think what, what we want to do is try to get to the point where we can say, is what's uh, requested even feasible? In many years, we can't um, even get to that point because we haven't had the luxury of unrestricted or excess fund balance. This year, our goal was really to just take that this first opportunity to lay out uh, what that might look like with all the department's requests, and then start our conversation uh, with you about additional priorities or how these uh, priorities may stack up. When you see that bottom line, yeah. with respect to the uh, street maintenance program, I know that there was some report that we put together in terms of the way in which the streets were originally planned to be resurfaced and so on, and that some streets have some base that's not really well. Um, is that factored into next year's? Um, yes, yes and no. So. Um, Next Thursday, on the 13th, we will look at the Capital Improvement Program, which has three components. So it will have a stormwater, a street, and a parks and recreation component, uh, driven by really those other uh, specific and dedicated uh, revenue streams. So we, um, the Capital Improvement Committee was scheduled to meet last night to consider and look at that uh, and consider a recommendation to you all. We did not have a quorum for that meeting last night. So we will still be bringing forward uh, a recommended uh, five-year capital improvement plan. It just will not be coming. It'll be coming from staff, not through the commission. We don't have time at this point to slow down and reschedule the meeting again. Um, so we will look at that, and, we'll, and um, one of the things that you'll get in a packet on Friday is kind of a project summary sheet that identifies everything that we've got in at a much higher level of detail in the next.
that's why we can plan in all of those areas. Streets, I think, is the one that's still giving us as a staff um, the greatest fits in terms of um, really trying to unpack and understand the data that we've collected and manage that. And one of the things that you will see is a recommendation to look at some asset inventories, both on the street and the stormwater side particularly, um, to help us really build that base um, and help make some of those future decisions. So we will, we will be talking about what's the best way to allocate. We still want to continue to allocate those resources to the street needs. Um, but we may pull back in terms of the, um, a clearer mill and overlay and ship seal program. That's that's kind of where we're in the weeds right now as a staff and understanding where have we spent dollars in the past, has it accomplished what we wanted it to, as we look at spending dollars going forward, um, how do we maximize that? If, if we're not increasing PCI ratings with the chip seal that we're doing, then maybe continuing to chip seal is not the best option for how we allocate those resources. So. It's going to be a little fuzzy, I think, in 2018 because we have a lot of those questions that we're still trying uh, to answer uh, while also trying to move forward uh, and make some progress. As we saw in just our you know, short budget survey that we did two weeks ago, streets were absolutely remained at the top of the list in terms of citizen priorities. And I think we would see that in the Direction Finder survey as well. Um, what the Direction Finder helped us do the last time uh, was really, we asked some very specific questions about how much, uh, you know, $6 a month, $15 a month, kinds of questions about how much more would you be willing to pay towards streets. Um, and I think that gave, when the, when the council was looking at setting that mill levy to replace the transportation utility fee, uh, I think that, that helped um, to drive some of that decision making process and, and make some of that, while certainly not easy, a little bit clearer. So. Um, Again, and at, so as we move into the threats uh, and challenges are probably greater, and we'll talk about those next week, we still have the tough repayment issue. Um, you know, you will see that we certainly didn't bring forward supplemental requests that took all of that excess fund balance. So if we were, if fund ups in a position to make a, have to repay the judgment on the initial tough case, there's, we could do that with cash on hand. The larger issue, Depending on how that would proceed, we might have to look at some other options. Um, but both the tough repayment question and then the potential renewal, so both the street sales tax and the parks and recreation sales tax will sunset within this next five year capital improvement program. So you'll see the impacts next week of what that looks like and, and how we want, might want to approach a potential renewal on that. So that will be, that area will certainly come forward next week uh, as you have more opportunity to kind of digest the general fund. Um, I'm going to go back just quickly and touch on a couple of other things which were assumptions that we will, will use and build on going forward in the budget coming out of our 2018 um, budget resolution. Uh, we will, we have historically subsidized a portion of the solid waste contract with general fund revenues to the tune of about $85,000. So that's certainly something that uh, we will talk about there's a slight about 3.6% rate increase in the, the contract with waste management for 2019. Um, so we will need to discuss as we look at all of our other funds whether the council wants to absorb all of that rate increase or pass some portion of that onto the residents. Uh, the current contract with waste management is set to expire at the end of 2019. So we, I anticipate we'll be going out through an RFP, RFQ process um, in 2019. We've built uh, the general fund budget maintaining the franchise and mill rate program uh, at their current levels, which is 100% of city franchise fees, 75% of <coughs> our total mill levy, excluding special assessments, which is the stormwater utility fee, and 50% of the solid waste utility fee. Uh, that certainly, I know there's been some conversation with the increase in assessed valuation. Is there a need to look at either adjusting the income requirements or expanding that pot of money? We haven't done that specifically in the draft budget that we presented. It's just hard to know at this point uh, what sort of response. I think we've sized the budget uh, based on the experience that we've had the last several years. Um, but we can certainly set aside some additional uh, resources if, if that was something that was of interest to the council. Uh, we, want to, we do want to continue to look at building an equipment reserve fund, or at least maintaining that, uh, taking care of our employees, both from merit and a benefit 
budget standpoint, um, maintaining funding for the business improvement grant, we did not increase that in the 2019 budget. Um, we have not had as great a response in 2018. Um, did we increase it? So we had, we did, yes. And so we just haven't had the same number. We're sort of out knocking on doors almost in some cases. Say. So, I mean, that's that's another one that if, you know, if we have some opportunity to build up a, a reserve or a fund of some type that we can continue to add to that pot, and if we don't spend it every year, it sort of rolls over and is available for those same purposes. Um, the other thing that we'll continue to work on, you know, with personnel expenses primarily and the revenue declines, we're kind of taking a backward step a little bit in terms of cost recovery at the community center. Um, that's been an area of focus for us for several years and will continue to be, you know, what is that, what is that balance? Um, you know, where should we be? Um, Has there been any more discussion about like energy efficiency, feasibility study for the community center and potentially this building? Or? So, CTS was more equipment as opposed to energy, but sort of a comp all of the above. So we've had a meeting in the last month or so with a group that has that capabilities and in fact we're going to sit down with them uh, in about a week to kind of review their reports where they've just identified preliminarily for us some areas where they think we could achieve some real savings. Obviously I think we would need to go out uh, probably for an RFQ to do that but I think um, they, if the information has been really helpful in, in, in identifying some of those areas and I think there's some really significant savings to be had so we're in the process of pursuing that if we can wrap that up um, you know before we get the budget adopted we will certainly incorporate that but that's an ongoing uh, will be an ongoing effort for us I did it work <laughs> responses have been pretty steady. Um, you know, we put it, we publicize it in the magazine, in the newsletter portion of the magazine, and, and get it out there. We have, I mean, I would say my experience has been since we implemented the program, we have sort of regular attenders. You've got the lines of books that, you know, that, that come in every year that we can count on. We just haven't seen dramatic increases uh, in that. And, and I, so I think it will be interesting to see whether that, you know, whether that changes. And again, as we get kind of our final assessed valuation numbers towards the end of this month, we may be able to have a better sense of that you know, as well. And that's certainly something if we get a higher demand that can be adjusted in you know, the part of mid-year in the budget. It's just, it's hard to know, and it's hard to tie up those resources uh, in some of those programs if you don't do the rest of Any other questions? Okay, so um, let's, next week, so this, this Friday you'll get a packet uh, on the five-year capital improvement program, which will include uh, an overview program spreadsheet of all of our revenues and expenses and then project detail sheets uh, for each of those. Um, we'll talk about that, then we will go take your questions, comments, uh, and spend um, the rest of June kind of working on really refining the budget. We'll come back on the 11th of July uh, with a proposed budget for 2019. Uh, and then we will have kind of a community conversation around that before um, we have our legally required public hearing on the 1st of August. Uh, targeting a budget adoption at the August 15th city council meeting. So again, um, you know, as we live and breathe in, in these line items and these numbers and these programs every day. So as you have, you know, over the next week or two, time to let them sink in a little bit more. As you have questions, if there's additional information that you would like to see, uh, other priorities that you would like us to, to consider, please just let Brian or I know, and we can certainly uh, begin to incorporate those. Yeah. Did you 
you get feedback on whether our council meeting should start early? Or I did, and in fact, if we're done with the budget, I have, uh, under a department update, I do have um, several meeting issues that we actually need to discuss as we were looking from now through the end of the year. Um, there's some things that may pop up that I want us to be so are we done with the budget? Sure. Okay. Yep. So, thank you for that segue. So we have the June 13th, so next Wednesday, budget work session on the CIP. And we have our June uh, 20th city council meeting. I had sent an email uh, last week sort of polling. We will need to have an executive session for an update on the top litigation. Uh, I've had the majority of folks uh, suggest ahead of time, but certainly want to know. <coughs> Tom Murray is available either at the beginning or the end. Um, so I thought I would leave that up to you all this evening for some final direction. But uh, we anticipate we would be probably about 45 minutes. So we would start at 6, uh, which would give us time to have the executive session and then have some time to come out. and. So, you're saying six so it is six for sure then? So that's, that's what the majority of you have responded back. So if you thought you did, okay. Then July 11th, we have the committee meetings. You may remember those were moved because the first one in July is July 4th. Uh, the next one is July 18th. We had we got our wires crossed on this one. So we were suggesting a community dialogue on the proposed budget. It had originally come out as July 25th, but it said July 25th at the city council meeting, which is not, July 25th is not the city council meeting. I think our recommendation, based on our uh, attendance and participation in the community conversation on the, bu on the budget, is, is that we try to hold that um, on the 18th in connection with your council meeting. Uh, maybe there's a better chance that we'll reach, uh, have a larger audience, um, and then that frees up July 25th for you all, um, or if we need an additional work session based on where we are in the budget, we could do that as well. Then we get through August and September, everything uh, stays on track. As we looked to November, November 7th, which would be our regular committee meeting night, there's a potential conflict with the NLC conference, which is scheduled for November 7th through 10th. And I didn't know who was planning to attend. So the, the question really there is, um, so two things in November. So. Potential conflict with NLC on our regular committee meeting night, and then the council meeting night is the night before Thanksgiving, which I don't know what your appetite or interest in attending a city council meeting on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving would be. Uh, so I think you know we have some options. You could look at a committee meeting on the 14th and council meeting on the 28th. Um, I think that looks good. Yes. And then the December 5th is typically, that would be our committee meeting. Uh, there is always that potential conflict with the Council of Mayors event on that first Wednesday, so we typically move that to um, the second Wednesday in December. And before we put it out on a calendar, just wanted to confirm that you all were comfortable with that so we can have that. So we would, the committee meeting in December would be the second Wednesday. So the 12th. So we'll update and revise calendars and get those out to you. Um, the NLC conference seems to move around in terms of, used to be much more closely restricted to the same a couple of weeks every year. So, and just uh, so I know, because I do think we will have uh, the potential for some other development projects to come forward over the course of the fall, and so if you do know there are council meetings that you may miss, or committee meetings that you may miss, if you can let us know as soon as you can, that great, so we can try to schedule things on our agenda accordingly. Uh, I may miss one, I'm on that solid waste commission, and I'm going to miss the time meetings on the 11th of July, I'm going to miss that one, and then we have it every month, so I may miss the one in November, because that's the same month that talks. I will miss the committee meeting in July, too. Okay. And 
and more. I already mentioned this, but I think I'm going to have to miss next week for work travel. Okay. So if anybody else thinks they are going to be absent in the, at the July committee meeting, the sooner we know that, the better, because we're going to get in the quorum issues. Okay. Oh, you're going to be too tired. Gotcha. This upcoming meeting in June. Yes. Okay. Unless I do it by phone, it's wrong. Is that the Sussex City Council meeting? City Council meeting? Okay. okay. Um, I will be gone October 3rd. And I think I'll be gone on October 3rd as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Better to know now. <laughs> okay. Like I said, I'll clean this up, send it back out. If there's something else that you can firm up, that would be great. Okay. 